Thank you, Ben. Hi, thank you so much for those presentations. Amazing, amazing stuff. And also, I feel like I'm kind of coming from a slightly different angle, which is quite, which is quite good. I think it will add some sort of perspective to this conversation. I'm, uh, I'm uh, Ben Servany, currently serving just at the very end of my tenure as a design fellow for software at Samsung, which is uh, quite an interesting landscape to be uh, uh, thinking about all of this in. Um, uh, previously, I was one of the designers of, um, of Flickr, which was a um, photo sharing application that many of you may have used back in the day. Now we have such a thing as back in the day in, uh, in internet co-production. But uh, um, uh, among other things, I had for many years a uh, foundation here that was called Verb, which was about the city as a platform for computational services, uh, which uh, we will be relaunching actually at the end of this year, which is uh, quite exciting for me to be thinking about. And thus, it sort of has led me into these investigations that kind of um, uh, cross or cross cross examinations, if you will, of both the kind of the theater that I've been operating in, which is in that of software design around you know um, mainstream kind of um, focused on often corporate contexts productivity, uh, but then sort of. Um, pivoting that to sort of, uh, if I can use a verb from that world, into uh, into the language of um, community product production and, and community control of resources and things like that. So um, part of the story that I was going to start with is uh, kind of apocryphal, although I've told it here uh, in Amsterdam a couple of times, which is about, uh, about the uh, origin of Flickr, which started as a massively multiplayer online game about creativity. Uh, the idea, actually, uh, my friend Stuart and I met at a conference here called Doors, Doors of Perception and had a conversation about uh, a game in which uh, everyone could take up the creative tasks that they were interested in and potentially uh, level up in those as they might in uh, in some other type of, you know, dragon fighting style game, except for in this case it might be more about the production of media, the production of um, potentially architecture, other other sort of semi-professional design roles or professional design roles that were represented in kind of a software context. Um, and uh, what we did was prototype the first role in that, in that system, which was the photographer, uh, and uh, then ran up against what happens in capital environments where uh, your uh, venture capitalist says, we love that, just do that from now on. Uh, and so rather than, rather than creating a platform in which there was an ecology of tasks that were being produced uh, and, and a broader sort of one might call an open system, we had instead a platform system which was Flickr specifically focused on uh, photographs as social objects. So, so it was sort of a, um, you know, the beginning, one of the first encounters I had with the kind of what rather than the, um, the kind of opening up and the multiplication of opportunities that these software tools could often provide. Instead, uh, often markets drive towards a um, distillation and focusing uh, of those of those capabilities. So there's definitely um, something to be said about uh, the ability to uh, for for opening, which is kind of what this what this panel is trying to address. Another another uh, organization I spent a lot of time with is called Stamen. They're a data visual data visualization agency in San Francisco, um, of which I was the director of product design for a while. Uh, and we worked on a project called uh, the Walking Papers, which was uh, a way in which people were able to contribute to OpenStreetMaps, which is a very large open data set project about mapping, uh, sort of to you know uh, allow for a Creative Commons controlled uh, set of resources about geography that wasn't owned by Google or one of the other incumbents. Um, and that process actually got us thinking a lot about how one designs a system that can scale to uh, the average citizen about their participation in a project, you know, a work project uh, that results in a product that is part of um, the actual infrastructure of the community. Um, oh, I'm hitting the wrong button, there we go. Uh, so to this regard, I would say that, you know, a lot of what I've been doing inside of um, Samsung has been thinking about uh, the future of work, and that sort of brings me to a lot of conclusions that may be antithetical to who their normal, uh, their normal clients are, who are sort of the Fortune 500 companies, but uh, I'm actually started to think about what happens um, in the situation where work is sort of, diffused into, um, you know, right now we sort of have the corporation, it tells the story of the task, right? You have a, a giant sort of like, we uh, care about 
agriculture or whatever it says, you know, ADM or some giant abstract corporation that's talking about tasks and they, they sort of control the discourse around what it means to be working in that field. And there was a time long before that in which um, there was a different set of regimes that controlled how the language developed around societal scale tasks. Um, I'm sort of proposing that maybe we reclaim that the entity that that was built around, which were guilds, which now at this point has been somewhat, you know, rejected for a variety of reasons involving, uh, you know, their their own monopolistic and elitist behavior. But I think we now can maybe take a step back and start to say, if work is is now turning into a set of tools that are potentially software defined, uh, that are cloud provisionable or at least network provisionable to a variety of different contexts, what what, how do you tell the story of what a big task is, what work is now? Uh, and, you know, again, I think we saw a diagram in an earlier presentation about how um, open software development, you know, and code repositories specifically is actually one of the places where the product of work uh, in this kind of new type of economics is stashed. And so, um, you know, that's sort of where I was going with this previous slide, which I was sort of saying that there is now, you know, there are these organizational fields in, uh, kind of the distributed work that happens happens in the software world that it are mostly involving uh, kind of allegiances to choices made in implementation technologies, right? So you don't necessarily have people that are specifically employees of a company, X, Y, or Z, but you do have people who are staunchly, you know, you used to have maybe in the, in the 50s at the height of the corporate model, at least in the US, you would have people that had almost a, you know, um, a familial affiliation with their with their company. You know, they would have conversations on the street about whether it was better to work for Ford or GM in Detroit or something. Obviously, Detroit now is a legacy for how useful it was to have those fights <laughs> because neither of those organizations really cared about the people who were fighting on their behalf. Um, but uh, the, these stack tribes instead are more people that have made choices in the tool sets that they use and they will form communities around those tool sets. For instance, in a lot of web development contexts, you have sort of you know, Ruby versus Node.js, for instance, or something like that, where people have decided, have made decisions on how they operate, and that now defines their community. So my, my question is, how do we turn those types of decisions that are, you know, in some ways about identity, honestly, in some ways about fashion. You know, if you're in San Francisco, there's always this really strange conversation you overhear at a cafe where someone says like, oh, you're using Angular? That's so like 2014 of you. You know, and it's like, wow, that's amazing that that's now, you know, those are the issues that that's like, you know, it's not about whose clothes you're wearing, but like which, you know, which latest JavaScript framework you're deploying in and if that's fashionable or not. Um, but regardless, I mean, I think, on the other hand, it's often really um, tempting in situations like this where we're talking about the social good uh, to dismiss uh, functions like fashion. You know, I think that, that, and that's one of the things when we talk about like how, you know, why do these things fail? Some of, one of the reasons is that they don't, you know, there is this quality without a name that is the catalytic element in an organization that has a self-identity. And some of that has to do with fashionability and celebrity and things that we don't really necessarily want to discuss all the time, but they are, the, they are often social functions in how, in how communities self-organize. Um, and so uh, one of the other things that I think, you know, the guild as an entity potentially has the, the power to uh, help people kind of self-organize around is the process of and also the recognition, you know, sort of the meritocratic recognition of people that are operators in the in the space that are that are powerfully uh, capable and can pass, you know, sort of not just utilitarian knowledge, but also sort of uh, social practice, almost sort of like shamanic understanding of the uptake of certain practices can be sort of handed from from people, you know, different people in the community. Which is to say that the guild, you know, actually was the place where the university was born. I mean, Oxford was born out of the Guildhall itself, and a lot of the livery corporations in, in the UK still exist as, as you know, contexts in which these types of knowledges are passed along. But I'd say that you know, there's something interesting in this inter, you know, uh, beginning to interpret the capabilities of a social network online as a place where um, you know, a formalized practice of um, a, a stack can be, can be recorded. In a way, there's something, you know, there's, there's, 
potentially something uh, a little bit occult in that, which is strange. So I think transparency and trust have to be a huge part of all of this. But I mean, certainly, you know, one might say, well, yes, the Freemasons also started as a way to pass on the knowledge about professional practices and then turned into something else entirely. But, but I think there's, a, you know, aside from that type of formalization without content, there's, a, there's something very, very specifically empowering about this, uh, about the development of an ontology and an epistemology, which was something that was brought up in an earlier session, the idea that partially what, um, what brings communities together is language and language about practice and design patterns about practice. And so the idea that you know, all, of these, um, all of these situations are um, defined by you know, a, a collaborative, it's sort of a, a vocabulary raising. It's not a barn raising, but it's an ontology raising. You know, everyone coming together to settle on a set of terms that describe the practice and then beginning to understand how that practice can be transmitted to people that are, that are in expressing interest in coming into that field and also how those, how those um, design patterns can be communicated across um, into organizations that these that these guilds might be working with, like traditional corporations or other guilds. You know, how are these? How how is the the language um, structured? Um, sorry. So this uh, the uh, collaborative direction I think is something that's even more important than just language as an as a as a, a fluid way of describing these patterns. But I think a new thing that's starting to emerge about uh, digital work practice is that there will be, for many contexts, a dynamic model of the result from the very beginning, right? If you talk about something like GitHub or a wiki or even an urban plan or any of these things, they exist as digital artifacts that are fleshed out over the course of production. And so by having a digital model that serves as your sort of teleological destination, you know, that you can then structure all of the ontology of your work on top of and all of the tasks on top of, that, that is really the first, this collaborative design task of what is the result, what is the sort of the science fiction of the result in a way. It's almost like, you know, one of the things that's interesting about architecture, it's sort of the oldest, one of the oldest uh, kind of practices that brought, you know, hundreds of people together into one project. And what it really was, was almost a very small cult about belief in the idea that this thing would ultimately exist, you know, and that, and that's really, you know, a way, that's sort of what corporations now serve as in our world is a, is a framework to believe in the result. Like, uh, and so what are the other viable frameworks to believe in the result? And a lot of those things now we're getting from digital tools like GitHub or like other, you know, situations where you first sort of sketch out uh, an idea that is the destination and that actually helps inform the language that makes the journey. And so, you know, I think a lot of this cooperativism is about the process of, you know, creating the tools that allow us to both define that destination, uh, also the language inside of it, and also how people move into uh, further expertise. You know, that, that's another thing that, that guilds always did was sort of help people understand who was specialized in what. There might be multiple roles in an overall practice, say in the building of infrastructure, for instance. There are, you know, structural engineering practices, architectural practices. These all have ways of being certified that now those certifications and things lie with agencies outside those of practice often, although there are some guilds that do Screen Actors Guild and very empowered, you know, sort of like very uh, high level jobs that, that have, you know, guild-like power already. But I think there are, there's the opportunity for these things to exist in, a, in an open ecology uh, of, of practice. Um, so I'm gonna run really fast through here because I think we have um, Doug Rushkoff is coming in after this, so. Um, anyway, so I, uh, I wanted to briefly talk about how this, you know, we went from social computing at the very beginning, like Flickr was this recognition that there are objects like photographs or other um, social resources that can be, you know, pivoted around by, by you know, in collaboration, used by people as, uh, you know, a medium for uh, the construction and communication of larger, of larger structures. Uh, then we sort of, then again, you know, much like I was saying before, there's this moment of collapse in, in, you know, sort of the, in capital production, you turn something like that into Facebook or into Google, you extract the value and you turn it into a platform, which is a, a type of capture. Uh, but I think that, you know, one of the things that a lot of people in the latest generation of the use of the, of, of the internet and the web don't remember is the, is the period of time in which it was driven by 
social production rather than platform capture. So we sort of have left social production behind into an era of platform capture, but I think now we might be exiting it again into an era of more structured social production because what we were lacking uh, in an era of social objects was the kind of inter-networking of those production cells essentially into federations in which those situ in which those resources could be exchanged and so i think that that's kind of the arch the sort of technical architecture that we have to be thinking about now is what you know where you know where you know what is the kind of level of granularity at which these types of federations exist um, and how do they internet work with each other um, um, so, you know, in, in reality, what we're talking about from a, from a resources perspective is, you know, um, there are these digital resources, there are now uh, a lot of infrastructural services like clouds, cl cloud backends that can be spun up and down, you know, uh, dynamic networks of mobile devices that can come together to share computing resources. Um, and then this sort of collaborative modeling that I was talking about before, which is the ability to build larger scale um, descriptions of a plan, whether that's about a city or about a co-op itself or about whatever, things that can be contributed to and changed and forked and commented on. Uh, and so, you know, this is kind of the recipe, I think, for these types of organizations going forward. Um, and, you know, we're now, I think just now beginning to recognize how fluid um, the response to, you know, I've heard a lot of you know fist shaking, you know, rightfully so, fist shaking about uh, you know Airbnb and, and Uber and all of this sort of sharing economy um, type of organizations. But I think that they're actually moving forward with the reality of this atomization of jobs. And I think that that you know that's scary, but also something that we can. Did that microphone go right now? There can be structures that that are as adaptive in a collaborative, cooperative environment uh, as those structures are. And so I think you know part of the thing that I, the, my worry is that a lot of, you know, organizations that are trying to um, counter some of the societal, you know, societally detrimental effects of Airbnb and Uber will confabulate, you know, the, the fluidity of their models with that problem. I think that there is still the possibility of fluid models for collaboration and work. Um, it, it just has to be, it has to happen in a framework that uh, is, Federation is emergent rather than top-down projection. So, so I think that you know, recognizing that you know these types of uh, fast-binding uh, um, distributed networks of collaborators that all have different roles that are bringing you know different roles to the table, different tool sets to the table, um, uh, needs to be recognized. But also, there needs to be a, a, a try, an investigation of who it is that's providing the protocols that allow all these entities to work together. You know, how is trust built? How is identity recognized? You know, these are you know sort of um, the the main issues for this you know for work going forward. So, you know, one of the one of the things, of course, when you mention you know guilds, certainly to a room full of people that have played computer games before, there's always talk of that. You know, that that's where this idea had somewhat of a rebirth, which was the idea that there were people that formed these kind of communities of interest. I mean, you know, interest in the lightest sense of the word, and the in the fact that you know they both like playing you know paladins or whatever online. But the point being that that uh, what happens in a in a massively multiplayer game, much like what I was talking about with Flickr, uh, as something that was born from a mass multiplayer game, the, you know, there are many software tools uh, in our future of work that will look very much like massively multiplayer games. We're entering a world of AR and you know, uh, systems that are built out of software tools that are dynamically assembled around the current project. Um, you know, lots, of, lots of these tools will work like that, and one of the tools in that system is a, is, uh, a way to create dynamic party, you know, partying up, for instance, is something that comes from this world. You know, the idea that there is a that there is a um, a sudden confluence of organization that is task based that brings a whole bunch of roles to the table that have some balance based on what the goal is, uh, and then a bunch of tools that allow people to understand ambiently the status of the people that they're working with, the you know the the short term goals of the people that they're working with. Um, 
who might have expertise in specific contexts that they're working in. Uh, and all of those tools, you know, operating in real time in the work environment is something that we're gonna learn to integrate as part of our, as, as part of our daily understanding of how work progresses. Um, so, you know, what we're kind of looking at, rather than saying that, you know, all of this stuff is operating inside of these kind of hyper-structured modernist regimes of the corporation or the state or various other large entities that can provide these these you know big containers for this. Instead, we're sort of now trying to figure out how, through rules-based setting of protocols and model descriptions and design patterns, how can you transmit the capability to build these organizations dynamically in an emergent way and in a way that they can federate around larger tasks that are societal goals. Yeah.